So welcome everyone to our annual spring retreat. We have several countries, many states, multiple time zones gathered together today uh, in celebration of the wonders of Zoom. I want to thank Father Sean for his time and his energy and generosity in putting these three days together for all of us. I want to thank him in particular for being our teacher and guide for this difficult topic, the problem of evil, especially after a year in which feelings have run especially deep and the balance of the light and the dark has been both delicate and fragile. And so, Father Sean. So I want to begin by a special thanks to Karen who has organized this. She's done all the heavy lifting. I'm just here as a, I'm Irish, so I'm just a mouth. I love to talk. And uh, also to David Karkik, whom you don't see, but who is the uh, IT technician behind this entire venture and who's also recording it so that at the end there'll be copies of this for everybody. Um, uh, your faces won't be shown or your voices won't be heard to give you anonymity, but your questions and comments will be uploaded in a written format uh, in the recording so that there's a, a permanent record subsequently. So I'm deeply grateful to... Uh, to David Karkik and to Karen for making this happen. So all of you should have received an, an outline of the various lectures. So this one obviously is lecture number one. And for the first day, what I want to do, I want to look at the, um, the, uh, the sources of evil. How, you know, what does the darkness seem to come from? And in lecture one, I'm gonna do a historical review, look at uh, past attempts to explain you know, the origin of evil or darkness. In the second lecture, I'll give my own theory about the origins, and then we'll take it from there for the next few days. So you should have a, a sheet that uh, tells you what lecture one is about, the sources of evil, former explanations, and um, the, I'll give an introduction. I'll talk about the, uh, the uh, book of Genesis and how it explains evil. I'll talk about the story of Job and how Job explains evil. I'll talk about Jesus and his theory, about Paul and his theory, about St. Augustine. And then I'm going to look at a few other ancient traditions, Greeks, Sumerians, Romans, um, Hindus, and then I'll draw a conclusion uh, for, the for the first lecture. So let me begin with a story, as I, I like to do always. And this was a, a very powerful vision I had many, many years ago, in which I, I saw a vision of a pregnant earth, a pregnant Gaia, mother earth. And I was watching her in profile so I could see her extended belly. And I could actually see inside her belly and I could see what she was pregnant with. And she was pregnant with the human species. So for, you know, 4.6 billion years, you know, planet earth, you know, was and originally was just the third rock from the sun in a particular solar system. But I believe that uh, it was inhabited and animated by a great soul whom I will call Gaia or Pachamama, and that she made a vow that she would breed life on planet Earth until she threw up a species which was capable of recognizing its own divinity, and ipso facto, the divinity of all other uh, forms of life on the planet. And she started that process 3.7 billion years ago, and she threw up, you know, single-celled amoebas, and then eventually marine life, and then plant life, and then uh, uh, fauna, and then hominids of various kinds, and then eventually homo sapiens and homo sapiens sapiens. And so the vision I had was she was pregnant with the human species. But I could see right into her womb, and it seemed that instead of there being just a sim single umbilical cord, that there were like uh, seven billion umbilical cords connected to all the individual members of the species. And I could see that at some stages, the mother herself was really vibrant and alive. And sometimes she was really wan and listless. And I could see that there was liquid uh, flowing through these umbilical cords. And that depending on the quality of the liquid, you know, whether it was clear and crystalline and pure, in which case she was vibrant and alive. And sometimes it was gunky and dark and she was listless. And the voice in the vision told me that this uh, quality of the liquid reflected the thoughts and the words 
and the actions of human beings. And that when there was a preponderance of love on the planet, then Gaia was alive and vibrant. When there was a preponderance of darkness and evil in either our thoughts or words or our actions, then she was one and listless. And so that for me represented the fact that you know, this is what our planet is like right now. Because the umbilical cord for a mother is doing two things. It's feeding the baby from the mother's own body and blood, and it is eliminating waste matter on behalf of the embryo. So the umbilical cord is working in two directions. And so the same thing is true of Gaia. Gaia is feeding us everything we wear, everything we breathe, everything we eat is given us by our mother. Uh, but at the same time, she's trying to eliminate all of the darkness and the gunk that we're creating. And this is real stress in the system. And this is why mothers experience, mothers to be experience, you know, morning sickness. It's because they're eliminating the waste matter on behalf of their baby in utero. And that the, uh, the sickness that the plant is experiencing right now is primarily of human origins. It's the planet trying to eliminate the waste matter that we are creating as human beings. And so that's what I want to, to, to speak about in this series. So I've addressed this topic over the last 33 years that I've been in Palo Alto. I've done it in individual lectures or individual homilies. And then for the month of February, I took, a, a I took three homilies in which I dealt with this topic three kind of 40-minute um, homilies. But I realized that, you know, even three sessions of 40 minutes couldn't do justice to a topic of this magnitude. And so I determined that I would spend the entire retreat, that we would spend, you know, six, one and a half hour sessions together brainstorming around this issue. Because the problem of evil, what theologians call theodicy, is the oldest existential problem that human beings have faced. From the time that we became rational animals with the advent of Homo sapiens, you know, 200,000 years ago, this was the issue that exercised us most, the problem of evil. What happens when we die? Where have we come from? You know, and why are bad things happening in our world? So it has proved to be the single most vexatious existential issue that human species has ever faced. And there have been many, many attempts to kind of wrestle with this. You know, theology has wrestled with it. Sociology has wrestled with it. Psychology has wrestled with it. Philosophy has wrestled with it. Science has wrestled with it. And sometimes they've come up with uh, simplistic solutions. And sometimes they've come up with very complex solutions. But ultimately, none of them have been completely satisfactory. So what I want to do then in this first lecture is look at some of the previous attempts. Um, I'm going to mention what they are. Some of them I disagree with, and all of them are kind of partial efforts to understand a very, very complex issue. And so for this first session, then I'm going to visit some of these attempts and I kind of give my own reaction to it. And then we'll open it up to Q&A and a question and answer discussion for the last half hour of this uh, lecture. So I'm kind of dealing with them more or less chronologically. So the, the first attempt we come across is an account in the book of Genesis, which is the first book of the Hebrew scriptures, and particularly in chapter three of that book. And it's, it was, um, this book began to be written about 950 BCE, before the common era. And in fact, the book continues to be, uh, to be written for several hundred years. It wasn't just that one scribe sat down and in the course of uh, an afternoon, you know, created the book of Genesis. It, there was, it took 400 years to gestate this particular book. And, and it begins in the southern kingdom of Israel about the year 950 uh, BC. And it's an attempt to make sense of the world in which they find themselves. And it's been written in the context of people who have been desert nomads for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And now they're settling down into an agricultural lifestyle and they have no kind of tradition of agriculture. They have been nomads up to now. And they're faced with a situation, a life situation, which is very complex, and they're attempting to make sense of it. Like every people in every era, we're trying to make sense of the world in which we find ourselves, and we come up with various explanations. So they're aware of the travails of childbirth, that women give birth to children in pain and agony and bleeding. 
They're aware of the difficulties of agriculture. They're attempting to kind of feed themselves and the land is giving them thorns and thistle, thistles, you know, as well as food. They're, they're experiencing famines. They're experiencing war being invaded by other peoples. They're experiencing individual murders with their own, their own tribes. And so they're trying to come up with a story that can make sense of all of these things. And they come up with the myth of the disobedience of Adam and Eve. Now, in order to kind of grok this story, we have to realize that we have to understand what a myth means. You know, and so people who dismiss myth as kind of the rantings of primitive peoples, they don't understand what myth is about. And on the other hand, people who take myth literally do not understand what myth is about. Mythology is the archived wisdom of a culture. It is the attempt to uh, encapsulate in story form the solutions to the problems that they experience as people. So it can't be, a, it can't be unpacked literally. And it can't be dismissed as the rantings of primitive peoples. Mythology is really, really deep, but you need to know how to unpack mythology. And so typically we've unpacked this myth in a literal fashion. So we think, for instance, that there were original parents, Adam and Eve, and they were put into a garden of pleasure called the Garden of Eden by a God who created them. And this God said to them, this is yours. Everything in this garden is yours. But there are two trees that you're not allowed to eat from. The first is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You're not allowed to eat from that tree. And the second one is the tree of life that confers immortality. You're not allowed to eat of that. That's only for us, the gods. And then allegedly the serpent comes along and he tempts Eve and she sees that the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is really precious looking and it must be really good to taste. And she's tempted and she eats it and she loves it and she gives it to her husband and he eats it and then God kicks him out of the garden in perpetuity and says, you're never allowed back in here. And he sends cherubim to be in charge of the gate that they can't get back in. So in perpetuity, they're being punished. You can't get back in here, and your children aren't welcome, and your grandchildren aren't welcome forever and ever. Amen. Now, this is a God, obviously, whom we have created in our image and likeness. This is not the God in whose image and likeness we have been created. But all peoples do that. All theologies do that. All, all of the gods that we've worshipped have been our, cre our own creations. We've attempted to make gods in our image and likeness, and they have been uh, the magnification of the projections of our individual experiences, you know, writ large. So instead of worshipping a god in whose image and likeness we, we've actually been created, we've tended to worship gods whom we have created in our own image and likeness. And I have just finished writing a book, which has gone to the uh, publishers uh, called Setting God Free, in which I'm trying to discriminate between the real God in whose image and likeness we were actually created and the God we've created in our image and likeness by just projecting our own evil material onto God and our own goodness onto God as well. So the, uh, the simple explanation then of this myth taken literally is that uh, all evil in the world is the result of Adam and Eve eating the forbidden fruit. So it's an act of disobedience and is compounded by some kind of a demonic entity called Satan in the guise of a serpent who tempted them. So the very first explanation we have then, you know, in the Judeo-Christian scriptures is the, uh, the fact that all evil came because we disobeyed, disobeyed God and we listened to Satan. So that would be the kind of the first and the oldest explanation in the Judeo-Christian system. The second explanation in the Hebrew scriptures comes about um, 400 years later, uh, um, about 550 BCE. And at this stage, the 10 northern tribes of Israel have been demolished by the Assyrian Empire, uh, who invaded in 722 BCE and take, took the, the 10 northern tribes into exile and they're never heard of again. They're called the Lost Tribes of Israel. Only two tribes survive, Judah and Benjamin, in the south around Jerusalem. But in 598 BC, they're invaded by the Babylonian Empire. And uh, in 589 BC, the first temple, which had been built by Solomon about 950 uh, BCE, was demolished, and the last two tribes were taken into exile. And while they're in exile, which lasted about 70 years, they come under the influence of the great uh, Zoroastrian religion, 
which had reduced the pantheon of divinities down to two gods, a uh, god of light and a god of darkness. The god of light was called Uhuru Mazda, and the god of darkness was called Ahriman. And so uh, evil then is a struggle between the forces of light and the forces of darkness. And at this stage, uh, the, uh, the Jewish people, the Judeans, are trying to create a mythology that will allow them to survive the real exile in which they find themselves. And so they begin to ask all these great existential questions, particularly the problem of evil, theodicy, where is evil from? And there's an entire book dedicated to kind of unpacking this problem. It's called the book of Job, written about 550 BC. And the book of Job basically is a little Semitic tale consisting of three chapters, which is unpacked in 39 extra chapters. So if you read the book of Job, you could go from chapter one to chapter two, and then skip to chapter 42, and you'd find the original Semitic tale. And it's a tale about a very rich man who's blessed by God. He's got children, he's got flocks of various kinds. He's very, very well regarded. And then uh, God has a kind of a council meeting with his own family, because there's a pantheon of gods at this stage. Judaism is not monotheistic by any means at this stage. So this God and his family are having a meeting. And one of the sons of God is called Satan, who's the kind of the, the adversary. And he says to God, you know, God is boasting about how good Job is. Look at him. You know, he really loves me. And Satan says, easy for him. You've blessed him. He's got great kids. You know, he's a very, very rich man. He's well regarded. Take these things from him and then see what happens. And the energy God says to Satan, okay, he's all yours. Do what you need. But you're not allowed to touch his body. And so over the course of the next few days, Satan arranges to have all his flocks stolen by marauding tribes people. But God, uh, Job still blesses God. And then, and then secondly, uh, Satan arranges to have all his kids killed. There's a big party being held by the firstborn child. He invites all of his brothers and sisters and the house falls on them and they're all killed. And Job still blesses God. And uh, God says to Satan, see, I told you, he's a really, really good man. And Satan says, yeah, but you know, people, you know, can say, okay, I believe in God until you touch themselves personally. And God says, okay. You can visit any kind of illness on him, but you're not allowed to kill him. So Satan visits all kinds of sores and welts and eczema and bleeding ulcers on Job's body. And this finally Job is too much for Job. And then Job begins to complain. And so that's the, uh, allegedly then at the end of it, God gives Job twice as much as he had originally. He's got instead of, you know, um, he blessed him with extra children, extra flocks. And it's like they all live happily ever after. So that's the original tale of just three chapters, chapter one, chapter two, and chapter 42. But in the middle, it's unpacked, trying to make sense of what happened to Job. And uh, there are basically uh, two kinds of explanations that we find in the book of Job. You know, you got Job's comforters who are saying to him, as he's sitting on the dung heap, you know, scraping the sores off his body with shards of glass. They're saying to him, you must have committed some secret sin because God is one. God is just, there's no afterlife, so everything has to be rewarded or punished in this life. You, so obviously you're being punished for something. Fess up, what did you do? And so that's one explanation. You must have done something wrong and you're not uh, prepared to confess it and that's why it's happening to you. Mm -hmm. And the other explanation is even worse. It is God ranting and raving against Job and saying, how dare you question me? Were you there when I created the world? Were you there when I said to the sea, thus far shalt thou come and no further? Who the hell are you to question me? And Job says, mm, I'm sorry, you know, I, I won't do it again. And so there are two simplistic explanations. One is there's a hidden sin and that's why evil entered into the world. And the other one is how dare you, you know, question me, God. So that was Job's attempt to make sense of the problem of evil. Obviously not very satisfactory to a, a modern audience. The third great explanation comes uh, from another great Jewish teacher, in my opinion, the greatest Jewish teacher of all time, Yeshua bin Yosef, Jesus of Nazareth. And when you read through the uh, teachings of Jesus, it seems that Jesus is saying that there are two sources for evil in our planet. The first one is demonic influences. And Jesus is convinced that all illnesses, whether they're physical, 
emotional, mental or spiritual or of demonic origin. Now, this is an explanation that most modern people would say, oh, he was a person of his time. I have to tell you that by the end of this series, I am more and more of the opinion that this is a very significant factor in evil on planet Earth. And I'll go into that in much more detail in, in lecture two this afternoon. So Jesus was convinced that a lot of evil in the planet is of demonic origin, um, including all illnesses of various kinds. So that's one source of evil as far as Jesus is concerned. And the other is a phrase he uses constantly, and you'll find this particularly in John's gospel, a phrase he calls it, the world. And you get this in John's gospel, and you get it in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were discovered in Israel between 1947 and 1952, the works of the great Essenes. And so again and again and again, you get this conflict between light and darkness. It's the same one that you had found in Zoroastrianism. So there's a battle between light and dark. Now, when Jesus uses the phrase, the, the world, I think he means two different things by it, and both of them important. The world can mean, for Jesus, means secular society, societies that don't place God center stage, you know, really secular regimes that when he uses the world, uh, the phrase the world, he has that in mind. I think by the world, he also means fundamentalist religion as distinct from mystical spirituality. And so you get a phrase, for instance, in John's gospel in chapter 14, Jesus says, this is the last supper, Jesus says, I will ask the father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. So for Jesus then, the, the remedy for the world or for secular society is the following. Again, you find it in John's gospel at the Last Supper. The remedy is the Father and I are one. He says, Christ is speaking to the assembled. And as I said yesterday in my homily, at the Seder meal, there were, the mothers were present. There wasn't a male entourage. It was all of the mothers, you know, all of the women who uh, uh, were disciples of Jesus Christ. And he's talking to this entire group of people. And he says, I am in you. And you are in me. And I am in the Father. In other words, we're holographic, holographic fractals of source. And the remedy for the evil is to realize that we are holographic fractals of source itself, of God herself. That that's the response to the world and to the, the demons that are interfering in the world. So that would have been Jesus' response. And again, I'm going to go into that more detail in the afternoon, because that makes a lot of sense to me as I look at the world that we find ourselves in in 2021. Number four uh, would be the teachings of St. Paul. And it's interesting, Paul picks up on the teachings of Jesus and he adds two more elements to it. And the first one he adds is what Paul calls the flesh. So he says, the good that I would, I do not. It is the evil I do not want to do, I find myself doing. So Paul talks about some kind of a battle within the flesh itself so between kind of our corporeality and our spirituality. So that's one piece that Paul adds to the equation, that there's this kind of internal division between maybe what others would call the ego and the soul or between the flesh, you know, and the, and the, the spirit. He also adds the notion of law, that law is a factor. So in Romans chapter nine, he says, for apart from the law, sin was dead. Once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang into life and I died. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. So what Paul is saying is, when you create bad legislation, you're forcing people to be criminals. And certainly you can't live in a modern society without being involved in a plethora of ridiculous kinds of laws that are forcing people into breaking laws. So Paul adds law as a factor in creating evil in our society. And then he picks up on the two pieces that Jesus had mentioned before him, and he's in full agreement with it. So here's what he has to say, that we're in, evil is being created by a secular society and by demonology of various kinds. So here's a, a phrase from uh, Paul's letter to the Ephesians. He says, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil 
in the heavenly realms. So in this one passage from uh, his letter to the Ephesians, he's talking about, you know, uh, evil forces within the world, you know, created by oligarchies of various kinds and evil forces from outside the system. So uh, uh, Paul is talking about four origins for the problem of evil. That's number four. The fifth person I want to mention is St. Augustine. Augustine flourished about uh, 400 uh, uh, CE, common era or AD, um, we sometimes call it. And Augustine reduced everything down to the flesh. It's all from the flesh. All evil comes from the flesh. And to give you the kind of background, um, Augustine is uh, an African born in Carthage, North Africa, um, who was a, a convert to Christianity. He led a real rakish life as a young man and, in fact, uh, fathered the child out the wedlock but then became a, a Christian and like many converts became, you know, totally dedicated to it. Now, although he lived in Carthage, he was a Roman citizen. And Augustine believed that the Roman Empire was kind of the epitome of rationality and organization, you know, and godliness. So he equated godliness with rationality and organizational capacity. So when you got a very well organized system that depended on reason, that there you are most godlike. So we are most godlike when we are most rational. But he's living at a time when the northern tribes, the kind of the, the Celts uh, from northern Europe and the Vandals and the Huns are attacking the Roman Empire and in fact have sacked Rome on several occasions. So much so that the emperor Constantine, you know, uh, migrated from Rome to Istanbul and then renamed Istanbul in his own uh, kind of image and likeness, call it Constantinople. And now Christianity is now the final bulwark against these pagans from the north and from the west. So Augustine is convinced that rationality is the sign of, uh, of, the, of the presence of God and irrationality is the sign of, the, of the, the demonic. So Augustine came to the conclusion that when a man and a woman are making love, at the moment of orgasm, that they are most irrational, they are most out of control. And it's at this stage that the baby is conceived. And so Augustine is convinced that, you know, orgasm is the seed of all evil. That at the moment in which we are most ungodlike, we create children and bring them into the world. And so they come in with what he called original sin. The original sin is the sin they picked up at the moment of orgasm between their parents. And it has three results, Augustine said. Because of this original sin, every single one of us is born with a darkened intellect. We can't understand the divine plan. Our will is weakened, he said. So we succumb easily to all manners of addictions, whether it's relationships, our anger, our warfare. And we keep repeating dumb mistakes, like smoking, even though we know it's going to kill us. Our warfare, although we know it's going to kill us. And the third result, he said, was, uh, firstly, our intellect is darkened. Secondly, our will is weakened. And thirdly, our, our bodies are subject to illness and finally to death. We have a shelf life, a very short shelf life. And indeed we do. You compare the human species you know, to other animals on the planet, and we've got a very short shelf life. Turtles live to be about 180. The Greenland shark lives to be about 400 years old. The ocean clam lives to be about 500 years old. And so there was Augustine's very simplistic you know, explanation for evil. All evil comes from orgasm. Very simple, very stupid. Number six, I want to look at some other ancient traditions and how they explain uh, the problem of evil. So when you look through the great mythologies of uh, our world, the Sumerians, allegedly the first civilization on the planet, going back about uh, 6,000 years, uh, who gave us writing, they gave us, you know, the legal systems, they gave us divorce, yeah, um, they gave us a ritual of various kinds, they gave us mathematics, they gave us geometry, you know, so they gave us all the great elements of um, civilization. And then there were the Greeks, and then there were the Romans, there were the Egyptians, in the Far East, the Chinese, um, and maybe Meso in South America, great civilizations in this part of the world. Uh, the Celts. But when you dig into the mythologies of all peoples, you find again and again and again, you know, that uh, the idea that we're created uh, in the image and likeness of some kinds of divine beings. You find it everywhere. And uh, so that we're created in the image and likeness of some kinds of gods. But when you look at the gods as they kind of appear in these mythologies, 
And again, I want to emphasize the fact that a myth is not a silly story made up by primitive peoples to explain things they don't fully understand, uh, nor is it a literal uh, um, enactment or a review of stuff that actually happened. It's uh, the ability to try to archive insights uh, in, in story form. And so in order to unpack them, you can unpack them literally, you can unpack them uh, symbolically, or you can un unpack them you know, um, mystically. So it becomes very important how you unpack uh, any myth. And I spoke about that a few Sundays ago as well. And we can talk about that later if you're interested. So basically these mythologists are talking about the fact that God's created human beings. In the case of the Sumerians, there was a belief system that 445,000 years ago, a group called the Anunnaki came to planet Earth to mine gold because the atmosphere in their own planet, a planet called Nibiru, was uh, disintegrating and they needed to spray gold dust in the atmosphere to protect themselves against solar radiation, which is interesting because we use gold in the windscreens of our spacecraft. The astronauts who went to the moon, there was gold literally in the, in the, the windscreens to protect against radiation. So the belief system was that they were mining gold on planet Earth to repair their own planetary system, but that they found this, very, this work really, really tedious. And so they looked around and they found, you know, um, hominid creatures that vaguely resemble themselves and they upgraded them genetically in a series of experimentations, firstly creating Homo sapiens 200,000 years ago and then Homo sapiens sapiens at 70,000 years ago. So Homo sapiens were rational beings who could think, but they couldn't think about thinking. So they, they didn't have language. Language is the ability to manipulate symbols intracranially, thus giving rise to language or language. Homo sapiens didn't have that ability. They could think like your dog can think or your cat can think, but they didn't have language that could articulate very eloquently what was going on inside in their own heads. That came much, much later, you know, with a second genetical modification that created Homo sapiens sapiens out of Homo sapiens. So the Sumerian belief system was that we were genetically modified in order to become a worker force to mine the gold in South Africa that they needed. And then we became so good at it that they made us gardeners and that the story of the Garden of Eden is a representation of the fact that these gods who are now living on planet Earth, guys like Enki and Enlil, you know, they had gardeners looking out their estates and that human beings were trained to do that. But that finally then, these gods are, are warring among themselves. So there's a war that goes on, for instance, between uh, the god Marduk, who was a son of Enki, and the sons of Enlil, over who would succeed their father, Anu, who was the high god back in Nibiru. And so this internecine warfare comes to planet Earth. And then they begin conscripting these recently genetically modified hominids into their war machines that taught them how to be soldiers and how to make war themselves. So now this is a meme that you're going to find in many of the other mythologies of the planet. You just don't find this among the Sumerians. You're going to get the same notion, you know, with the Egyptians. You're going to, going to get it with the Assyrian. You're going to get it with the Akkadian. You're going to get it with the, um, the, the Greeks and the Romans. That God's made us in their own image and likeness, upgraded us, and then, you know, introduced us to all manners of bacchanalia and sexual depravity. So many of these gods, you know, uh, were guilty of incest in their own families and of uh, um, sexual trysts with human beings, their own creations. You even find this in the book of Genesis in chapter six, where we are told that the sons of God found the daughters of men to be very attractive and they took them to wife as many as they wanted her, and they gave birth to a, a race of giants called the, uh, an, uh, the uh, Anakim. And you find this repeated in the Bible several times. So even within the uh, Judeo-Christian scriptures, you have this notion that the gods, and there were many of them, you know, you know had, had uh, sexual relations with their own creations, human beings, which is why the flood was created. That's, you, that's the story you get in the book of Genesis, that the gods finally got so fed up with human depravity, and particularly the fact that their own sons were intermarrying with their own creation, that they decided to wipe out the experiment completely and send a flood to destroy all of, uh, all of creation. 
So these are the stories, and there's obviously there's some there's some uh, truth hidden deeply within that, whether you translate it literally, symbolically, or um, mystically. So you get the very very same thing in all the great mythologies, that these gods created us in their image and likeness for whatever reason, that they engaged themselves in internecine warfare, and that they conscripted us. And that added to that, you get the notion that sometimes they vented their frustrations on us in various ways. Like, you know, a drunk husband comes home and he beats his wife. And the, the wife beats her, her daughter and the daughter goes out and kicks the dog. That word is like displaced aggression. That people who are discriminated against are punished in some ways, continue to visit that and people who are below them in the hierarchy. And that this is one of the reasons that evil is part of our planet. The gods are visiting their frustrations in us and we're passing it on to others beneath us in some kind of perceived hierarchy. And then finally, the final kicker was that these gods then gave us laws and they punished us for the infractions of these laws, laws that they themselves did not keep. And so, for instance, when you get uh, the, the, the God that comes through in the Judeo-Christian scriptures who says, thou shalt not kill. And if you actually work your way through uh, the first five books of the scriptures, which I've done for my, the book, I'm, which will just be published in a few months, God willing, God is guilty of at least two and a half million murders. And that's leaving out the flood completely where he wipes out everything. Where you actually count the numbers of murders mentioned in the, in the scriptures and you add them up, you're looking at over two and a half million murders that God personally orchestrated. Uh, either uh, directly or through his soldiery of various kinds. So they make laws that they don't keep themselves. So all of these ancient traditions give us the same kind of story. Uh, we get the very same thing in the great Hindu scriptures. You get this constant war that goes on between what are called the Devas and the Asuras, wars between these two versions of the gods into which they conscript us. And when you actually read the, some of the Hindu scriptures, and some of the Hindu scriptures go back, you know, nearly 7,000 years, some of the earliest writings, and there are descriptions of what they call in the scripture, in the Hebrew, in the Hindu scriptures, vimanas, spacecraft, with actually descriptions that match what we would now call flying saucers or UFOs in conflict with each other, sky battles going on, uh, visiting us and conscripting human beings into this battle between the devas and the asuras. Now, what uh, Hinduism adds to the equation is the notion of karma and reincarnation that we get, you know, we are, you know, we have to deal with the consequences of our own actions and thoughts and words, and we get as many lifetimes as we need until we finally reach enlightenment. So what I'm saying basically in this first lecture is that, you know, these are previous attempts to make sense of the very real life situations in which we find ourselves. Now, I want to try and end this first lecture with a kind of a more positive, upbeat look at it. And then we'll open it up to question and answer discussion. So I keep saying to you again and again and again that every single one of us volunteered to be here now. And I love this beautiful, and I've sung it for you a few times even, this beautiful phrase from um, the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah flourished about uh, 742 BCE. And we know this uh, precisely because, you know, he talks about the death of King Uzziah. He says, in the year of the death of uh, King Uzziah, I had the following vision. And he describes a vision he had of God. Now we know from secular histories that uh, King Uzziah, uh, Uzziah of uh, Israel died in the year 742 BCE, according to secular calendars. So we can date this very precisely. So this was a, uh, a vision in which Isaiah hears God saying, whom shall I send? I have heard, seen my people suffering, whom shall I send? You know, and uh, Isaiah says, here I am, Lord, send me, I will go. And there's this beautiful hymn that we sing very, very often where, you know, putting words into the mouth of God and the mouth of Isaiah, it says something like, I, the Lord of sea and sky, I have heard my people cry. I will send my life to them. 
Whom shall I send? And Isaiah replies, Here I am, Lord. It is I, Lord. I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord, if you send me. I will hold your people in my heart. And this is the song that every one of you sang. This is the song that every single human being on the planet sang. We were born and there's amnesia for who we really are. And we spend most of our lives asleep at the wheel. We who volunteered to come down now, knowing precisely this period of human history into which we were parachuting. And we knew that we volunteered because we were holding God's people in our heart. That we watched the suffering and the problems of previous generations. And we said, I can do something about this. I can come in. I can be a fully awake human being. I can realize that I am who I am. I can realize that I'm a spirit in a spacesuit. I'm not the spacesuit. I'm a spirit in the spacesuit. I can realize that I'm a soul on safari on planet Earth. I can realize that I'm a bite-sized piece of God who volunteered for human incarnation. I can realize that I'm a holographic fractal of source and I have come in here to make a difference. I've come here, you know, as uh, Buddhism will make the differentiation between what they call Turiya and Turiyatita. Turiyatita is the realization of the witnessing consciousness that I am an eternal being. I'm observing what's happening on planet Earth, but I'm not identifying with it. And they call that Turiya. Um, Hinduism will call that Atman. But there also, Buddhism talks about Turiyatita. And Turiyatita is the ability to walk on two legs, to walk as a witness not identifying with incarnation, but also to accept the fact that I'm experiencing incarnation. So to walk with the two legs, the witnessing part of me that realizes I am not my incarnation, but I volunteered for incarnation. And that therefore I can hold this dual perspective. I can experience what I'm experiencing as really as anybody else on the planet and as fully as anybody who's suffering on the planet, but I'm not gonna identify with that because I realize that this was a mission I signed up for, but this is not who I really am. Ultimately, I am not that. I am who I am. I am that I am. I am God in a particular form. So I differentiate between what I call soul Sean and role Sean. So soul Sean is who I really, really am before I became an Irishman. And role Sean is the guy you're looking at and listening to with an Irish accent. And every one of you can say the same thing. There is the soul you, and is there, there is the role you. The role you is the mission you're on this time around. And so ultimately, the enlightenment process consists of pondering and being able to find satisfactory answers to four questions. And I've run those questions by you again and again and again. The first one is, who is God? Who do I think God is? Is God this distant, demanding deity, this punitive entity who makes laws that he doesn't keep himself? Or is this God some kind of ineffable, you know, inarticulatable mystery which you can experience, but which you cannot, you know, speak about even? So who is God for you? That, that becomes really important to spend time on that. Secondly, to ask, who am I? Who do you regard yourself to be? Are you identified with your spacesuit are you identified with your spirit? Are you able to move into Turiya, into witnessing consciousness? Are you totally blindsided uh, by the human experiences that you're having? So answer, who am I for yourself? Thirdly, the question, who is my neighbor? Is my neighbor the person who votes for the same party that I vote for? Is my neighbor the person who has the same belief system about COVID-19 as I do? 
is my neighbor the same person who has the same perspectives on you know uh, race or ethnicity or all of the issues that divide us or is my neighbor all sentient beings all those you know instances, all of those stages which Pachamama went through as she was attempting to throw up a species which would be capable of recognizing its own divinity and ipso facto the divinity of all other beings. Is that who neighbor is for you? And then finally, what is my mission? What have you come here to do? What did you volunteer for? And have you remembered that? Are you so kind of caught up with putting food on the table for your kids, you know, are surviving an epidemic that you've lost sight of the very reason that you're here. Namaste. God bless you, Joe. So, and you're saying something very important. Um, for every single one of us, there's going to be something that's waking us up. For you, it was those two hymns as a little child, an altar boy that called to your soul to awaken you. For some people, it's going to be art. For some people, it's going to be dance. For some people, it's going to be a great book they read. For some people, it's going to be a lecture they heard. For some people, it's going to be a teacher they encounter. For all of us, it may be something different. But I guarantee you, God does not send us on a mission without giving us the resources we need and the teachers that are going to come into our lives. And so it's a question of just keeping our eyes and our ears open for, you know, what is it and who is it that's, you know, going to make me finally become aware of who I am and why I'm here. So it's very important that we look around, you know, for those books or those um, pieces of art or that music or whatever it is that's going to call to us. Thanks for that. This theory of the Anunnaki and Nibiru was popularized by a great scholar called uh, Zechariah Sitchin. Um, he was um, from, I believe, Azerbaijan. Uh, of Jewish origin. He was one of the few scholars in the world who, was, uh, who could read Sumerian cuneiform. And so he translated many of the clay tablets that were found in the, uh, in the, um, uh, the, the great reservoir uh, repository of Ashurbanipal when it was discovered in an archeological dig. You know, he found these clay tablets and he's one of the few scholars who could actually read the cuneiform and has written a lot about it. And his thesis was what I just mentioned, that 445,000 years ago, a group of uh, extraterrestrials on a planet called Nibiru that intersected uh, with our solar system. It's actually part of our solar system, but in a very huge elliptical orbit that only visits our vicinity every 3,600 years. You know, and that uh, they made a slave race, they upgraded hominids on the planet, made a slave race out of them, you know, called homo sapiens, homo sapiens sapiens, and that, you know, they departed and that their, their planet comes back about every 3,600 years. And it creates all kinds of perturbations because when you get a huge, big, massive body coming into the solar system, it exercises uh, extraordinary gravitational pulls, which can have hu huge effects on, on uh, tides and stuff like that. Now, there are a few different uh, explanations as to when that 3,600 year cycle uh, can, can happen. My own best mathematical guess on it is that we're actually 2,200 years away from the next visit. Uh, so, uh, so I think that the great flood that was talked about right. in many of the yeah. great mythologies and for which there's great, tremendous evidence happened actually uh, about uh, uh, 13,000, about, uh, about 13,000 years ago. So uh, based on that process, I'm calculating that they're not due back for another uh, 2,200 years. That's, that's a great question, Carl. And it's ultimately tied up with what I'm gonna talk about in the second lecture, because I really believe that there is an agenda to make the world forget, literally. Uh, it's orchestrated by twin forces. An oligarchy who has managed what I call a migrating oligarchy. When I look at the history of quote unquote civilization on our planet, it feels to me like there's a constant westward movement of an oligarchy that you know repeats from uh, civilization to civilization, whose agenda is to kind of totally secularize the world and, and uh, get rid of spirituality. Uh, and that it's been orchestrated as well by an off world you know, civilization. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, there are twin aspects to it. Uh, so I look at, you know, the first great civilization 
that we're aware of, particularly in our kind of um, Eurocentric or kind of Levant-centric worldview. By Levant, I mean the Middle East. So the first great civilization is the Akkadians. The Akkadians are overthrown by uh, the Assyrians. The Assyrians are overthrown by the Babylonians. The Babylonians are at war constantly uh, with the, um, uh, the Egyptians. Uh, the Babylonians are finally overthrown by the Persians. The Persians are overthrown by the Greeks. The Greeks are overthrown by the Romans. The Romans finally are overthrown by the Portuguese and by the Spaniards who are overthrown by the British, who are overthrown by the American empire, which has now been overthrown by the Chinese empire. So it's like it's gone almost full circle. And there's this oligarchy of people who are total secularists and everything to do, they do is predicated on uh, erasing spirituality from the planet. And in my opinion, and I'll talk about this in the second lecture in more depth, that it's literally been done in cahoots of an off-world uh, civilization, which is dedicated to creating total amnesia on the planet for our origins, the fact that we're holographic fractals of source. So there are, there are uh, two uh, kind of uh, two spearheads driving this secularization process. It's attacking both, you know, a secular society, whether you're talking about industry or military or economics or uh, education, whatever, and it's attacking religion. Religious organizations are becoming more and more secularized, are fundamentalized in ways. Less and less are they interested in the, in the spiritual or the mystical. So it's an all over assault on, you know, the image of God within us. And he flourished exactly at the same time as Augustine and St. Jerome, the guy who gave us the, uh, the Vulgate translation of the um, Judeo-Christian scriptures. Uh, so Pelagius as a Celt, and I've actually given lectures on Celtic spirituality in the past, and you can find them on my, mice, on my um, website, that Celtic spirituality is very, very, very nature-based. You know, that for the Celts, you know, um, the goddesses were the archetypes of nature, and the gods were the archetypes of culture. Yeah. And culture and nature were lovers in the Celtic uh, mythology. They weren't enemies as we have so much in, in the West. And so yeah. Pelagius is coming out of a Celtic mindset in which nature itself is, is, is the original blessing. Yeah. And uh, he was a brilliant scholar. He was fluent in Greek and Latin and Gaelic, obviously. You know, And uh, he was very, very well thought of when he went, he went to Europe and he was a great scholar and was befriended by the Pope at the time. And originally was even friends with Augustine until they fell out over this. And uh, uh, Jerome weighed in on it. Jerome, uh, who flourished around the year 400 as well, was the person who did the, um, the uh, translation of the Hebrew scriptures from Hebrew and Aramaic into Latin and the um, New Testament from Greek into Latin. And he had a version which is called the Vulgate, which definitely yeah. means Latin, the popular one. It didn't mean vulgar yes. in the sense we use it. Vulgar meant the common usage. And yeah. so he was the one who translated that. And so I, originally Jerome was fascinated as well by the teachings of Pelagius. But then Augustine really weighed in with his idea of original sin. And so Pelagius was regarded as a heretic and had to flee. And he was actually... Um, he was taken in by the Bishop of Alexandria at the time in Egypt and given shelter for a period of time. But like all great mystical traditions, they go temporarily underground to emerge again and again when the mystic impulse hits different charismatic leaders. So I've shared with you one time about a custom we had in Ireland when I was still when I was a child. There were houses in Ireland in which the fire had not gone out for over 300 years. Yeah. And so what happened, we used turf or uh, what you call here, peat. So at night, the mother would be the last person to go to bed. And she'd take the glowing embers and she'd cover them over with the, 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 the kind of the, uh, um, the, the ashes of, the, of the, uh, the peat. And then in the morning, she'd be the first person up and she'd blow on the ashes and rekindle the fire and put more sods of turf on it. And so literally the fire didn't go out for 300 years in some houses. Now that for me became a kind of a metaphor for the mystical impulse. The mystical impulse is constantly driven underground by dogmatic religion. And we certainly oh. found that in Christianity and Roman Catholicism, but you find it in all religions. It goes underground, it's driven underground, but it never, it's never quenched. All it needs is for some charismatic prophetic figure like a St. Francis of Assisi to blow on the embers and add peace to it and it blazes into fire again. 
And yeah. so Pelagius was such a kind of a, a mystic. And okay. maybe the embers of his teaching were covered over, but you cannot really cover over the mystical impulse. It will continue to come through. And there have been great, you know, mystics in our own times and prophets in our own times who've continued uh, to rekindle that, that fire. And uh, it, it's, it's blazing up. It cannot be put out. And in the midst of the darkness that we're experiencing right now, there are fires all over the planet. And I don't mean forest fires burning up our, our forests. I mean uh, charismatic individuals who are setting the human heart aflame again. It's a very important question, and the answer is a very important answer. The Hebrew scriptures are one of the most extraordinarily mystical writings human beings have ever come up with. But you have to realize two things. It's, it's being articulated by a people who are nomadic pastors recently setting down. It's been, it's been written particularly at a time when the remnant of the Jewish people are almost extinguished. And they're having to come up with a story that allows them to understand their own origins and their own destiny. And this is a people like none others that have survived all kinds of vicissitude and still clung tenaciously to their own mystical tradition. They, without the Hebrew scriptures, planet Earth would be impoverished. The question becomes then is, how do you relate to the Hebrew scriptures? And I've said again and again and again, there are three ways of responding and unpacking any myth. A literal interpretation, a symbolic interpretation, and a mystical interpretation. And I'll give you just a simple example to illustrate what I mean. So you can then use this methodology to go back and to examine any story in the Hebrew scriptures. And if you can get your mind beyond the literalism of the story, either into the symbology of it or into the mysticism of it, you have a treasure trove in the Hebrew scriptures of a solution to our present human dilemmas. So let me give you an example from the Judeo Christian scriptures because Jesus was a, a Jewish rabbi. There's a story uh, of, of Jesus in the transfiguration scene. And you know what the story is. The story is that about a week before he died, Jesus takes three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John, and they go up a mountain, a mountain called Thabor. And uh, they have an experience, they have an encounter with Moses and Elijah. Now, Moses was dead 1,250 years, and Elijah's dead 850 years. And so you could say, it was this a literal event? Did Jesus actually schlep to the top of the mountain with three guys? Did they actually have an encounter with two ghosts who were dead, you know, 1,250 and 850 years? Is that really what happened? Now, if you want to interpret that literally, some people will. You know, for me, it doesn't make much sense. Now you could uh, interpret that symbolically. <clears throat> and here's what it means symbolically. The Hebrew scriptures are divided into three parts. There's an acronym for it called Tanakh, T-N-K. T stands for Torah, which means the law, um, uh, the first five books of the Hebrew scriptures, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. N stands for Nevi'im, which is the Hebrew word for prophets. And it's also the Swahili word. And Nabi in Swahili means a prophet. And so these are the prophetic uh, words like uh, Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Amos and Hosea, uh, those people. And then there was a third group called uh, Kituvim. Uh, Kituvim meaning the writings. And it's the same word in Swahili. Kitabu in Swahili means a book. Now, the writings were books that didn't fall either into the law category or into the uh, uh, Nevi, the um, prophet category. There were existential writings. And the Psalms come into those, and uh, books like Ruth, and uh, books like Job. And they were written, a lot of them, during the Babylonian exile, under the influence of Zoroastrianism. And so, now, uh, later at the time of Jesus, the, the priestly caste did not believe in the writings. They believed there were only two parts to Scripture, the law and the prophets. They did not accept the writings. The Pharisees, the lay theologians, accepted all three the law, the prophets, and the writings. So they believed that there was both an oral and a written tradition, not just a written one. Now, uh, for the priestly caste then, uh, Moses represented the law, and Elijah represented the prophets. He was the first prophet, 850 BC, before Isaiah was about 750 BC. And so symbolic, you could say that 
uh, Thebor represented a symbolic encounter. A mountain all represents a theophany because it, it, it pierces the heavens in some way. So anything that happens on a mountaintop, like Moses receiving the law, you know, our St. Patrick on, on Croke Patrick, anybody on a mountaintop is symbolic of a theophany, uh, an encounter with the divine. So you could say symbolically it means that Jesus is having a theophany. And he's encountering, you know, the essence of his own wisdom tradition, Judaism, as represented by the archetype of the law, Moses, and the archetype of the prophets, Elijah. So now you've got a symbolic articulation or interpretation of this story. A mystical interpretation will be the following. That Jesus is not so much going up on a physical mountain and having an encounter with the ghost of the two dead heroes, but that he's accessing his higher self his soul self, the soul Jesus, as distinct from the role Jesus. And that his soul self is preparing him for the most important week of his life. He's going to be captured. He's going to be interrogated. He's going to be crucified. And he's going to rise from the dead. And so in some senses, he's having an encounter with his highest self. And it's preparing him for what's going to happen in the week ahead. And I've seen this as that Jesus, you know, we are told his face glowed, you know, like the sun and even his garments became whiter than a fuller's lie can make them. For me, what it represents is Jesus having a dress rehearsal for the resurrection experience. When his, entire, when his body, when his soul body will resurrect with such an extraordinary radiation burst that it will imprint even the wounds on his physical body onto the shroud of Turin subsequently. Something that happened in literally one billionth of a second with more power than this can be created by all the nuclear reactors on planet Earth right now, imprinting an image on a piece of linen. And that this was kind of the dress rehearsal for that. So there would be a mystical interpretation of the same event. Now I guarantee you, if you take that protocol and you apply it to any story in the Hebrew scriptures, you'll find that this is a treasure trove of wisdom, not to be dismissed by people who can only see the literal aspect of it. Great observation. i make two responses to it. The first one is that you are, uh, in order to kind of understand what the light is about, you have to understand the darkness in which it's uh, attempting to beam the light. So if your car is ca causing problems and you bring it to the mechanic, you know, you can't just say, you know, here's my car. You can say, why did you bring it in? You say, well, I'm having problems. What kind of problems are you having? You say, well, the brakes aren't working or it's burning oil or something. So first you have to tell what the symptoms are. Then he's going to make a diagnosis. Then he's going to give you a prognosis. It's going to take me three days to fix this and to get parts, you know, come back and, you know, Friday or whatever. And then there's the kind of the, uh, the, the protocol he's going to run to fix it. The same thing is true of our world right now. We have to figure out what the symptoms are. We have to make a diagnosis, we have to have a prognosis, and then we have to kind of uh, 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 plan a healing, healing plan. And so that's what we're all about. So firstly, we have to understand what the issues are and, and determine what the causes of the issues are, and then we can take the steps necessary. Now, the second response I'll make to you is this, that um, um, the, the board of directors at COJ has uh, made a decision uh, to, re, to resurrect the exploration group that we had way back in 2011, which was looking at the state of our world way back then and looking at various aspects, all the way from agriculture, you know, uh, to zoology of the issues that face us. And we're re resurrecting that. So there's gonna be a forum uh, for people, you know, to upload resources of various kinds and say, you know, here's a book I found interesting. Here's a podcast I'm interested in. Here's an author. I find fascinating. Here's a website that's really important as we discuss these issues. So there's going to be a forum available for anybody who's interested, you know, to find out what resources are available, what, what beings of light, what characters like Richard Rohr, you know, or John Chichester are available to us, you know, at this period of our time. So hopefully there's going to be a venue for people to share resources and even to share, to, to share personal ideas. And it's, uh, we're in the process of, of uh, setting it up right now. So it is very important. It's a, great, it's a very important issue. And I'm going to be addressing part of it actually in uh, probably tomorrow. But it becomes really important that we're au fait and conversant with all sides of this argument. Because if we're only hearing one side of any issue, 
we have uh, an exaggerated uh, vision of what it involves and what the solutions might be. So it becomes very, very uh, important. The, the single biggest issue facing planet Earth right now, in my opinion, is censorship, that we do mm -hmm. not have access to all sides of all of the important issues we're discussing. And so whenever you get one group in charge of the narrative, then you get a particular perspective, which is promoted as the truth, when in fact it is simply a perspective. So uh, we firstly need to deal with the issue of censorship to make sure that all parties are welcome to the dialogue and that the best way to kill a bad idea is to discuss it, not to oppress it or not to allow it a, a voice. And so mm -hmm. you're absolutely right. This and many, many, other, many, many other grave issues of our time will only be solved not by simplistic analysis of very complex issues and not by pseudo solutions, you know, that one size fits all, but by examining in great detail the origins of all of these issues, the historicity of these, and then figuring out who are the great minds that are debating these issues and have access to all sides of the debate. And then, and only then are we in a position to move forward as a united family.